Hello everyone and welcome to Commodity Culture where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice, do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the founder and CEO of White Tundra Investments, an actively managed stock portfolio focusing on undervalued Canadian oil and gas companies, Mr. Shabam Garg. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. I'm very excited because I've been wanting to dive more into the oil and gas sector. I've personally developed quite a passion for it recently. I think there's not enough content out there covering the space. So it's amazing to have an expert like yourself. And I'd like to start the same way I do with all my new guests, which is with their origin story. So how did you first discover investing and what ultimately led you to the oil and gas space? Yeah, you bet. So there's kind of a two two prong answer to that. Um, as a kid, I was always into money and, and trying to make more money, and really wanted to live this you know fashion lifestyle. So I was like, okay, well, I I have to make money, and the way to do it really is through investing. Let let that money compound um, over time, and I've always been enthralled by that. Um, and then so grew up in Kuwait, which is a big oil and gas producer, as you know. Dad worked in the industry, so we were always exposed to oil and gas, uh, whether it was through his work, whether it was through family gatherings or just around society, what you saw. So uh, that was the first little introduction. Then we moved to Calgary in 2006, which again is a oil and gas um, hub. So always been around oil. And then when I when I decided to go to college, uh, decided to go into petroleum engineering, like oil and gas was just in my veins. I was, I was loving the talk around this exploratory wildcat nature of oil, the fact that you're literally pulling um, stuff out of the ground. So I um, really got more and more into it. And then when I when I started college, I figured, well, I might as well invest in these companies um, and, and learn more about them if I'm going to be doing my engineering um, sort of studies on, on their own assets and, and what they do. So uh, 2013, got started with a little bit of money. Um, not the right time to get into oil, obviously. Uh, 2014, 15 were, were pretty bad years, but a lot of learnings came out of that. And took those learnings over the next few years, um, and then and then when COVID hit, it was really like, here is your 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 chance because when the oil cycles turn, you don't just make two, three, five x, you make fifty, hundred, five hundred x, if you can compound your money properly uh, through that cycle. So, um, that's a little bit of history on uh, on how I got into it, and then I I just went, um, you know, things went really good, and in early twenty twenty one, left the oil patch. Uh, went full time into investing and uh, launched White Tundra in in September of last year. Um, it's just been fantastic ever since. I think uh, energy's been once again a top performer this year. So, uh, hoping to continue that uh, journey here. Great. Well, let's start with a broader question first, and that is, what are the main catalysts and tailwinds you see for the oil and gas space as we move into twenty twenty three? Yeah, great question. And I think one that's on top of mind right now with the recent volatility we've seen. Um, I think the the factors haven't really changed all that much in the last, call it three to six months. The big one, obviously, being the Chinese reopening. Uh, this is a factor that I think is, is a little bit misunderstood. Uh, the numbers being thrown around as to what sort of demand would come online with the Chinese reopening, I think is very, very underestimated uh, because it's not just China that reopens. It's the entire Southeast Asian economies that reopen. Um, a lot of the tourism and business in the Southeast Asian economies, uh, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, even Vietnam, is, is very tied in to what's going on in China and the supply and, and deal flow through that. So I think that's, that's one of the major factors. We're seeing a turn around the corner on that as we head into um, the, the end of the year here. And then the other one being the Russian barrels. So, so there was this uh, narrative throughout the year that Russian barrels would be dropping off as, as time goes on, and it hasn't really materialized. So um, I think the, the Russians have done an exceptional job at keeping their production online, uh, despite not having the full Western support, the full Western expertise. Uh, but I think as uh, us, us people who've, who've operated wells in the field know, it's the winter when things really ratchet up. Uh, the summer is a relatively lull period where, where things are easier to operate. Um, and then winter hits. And, and it's not even winter hitting that causes the problem. It's the first major issue that happens in winter. And if you can't get that fixed in time, or it's just too cold for too long, those things start to become a snowball effect and, and really impact um, your, your major flow lines, your major pipelines, uh, your major gathering facilities. And, and it just becomes this um, effect. So... 
nothing nothing really so far that shows that there's any sort of major problems uh, but as we know winter is not just two weeks it's three four five months uh, up in those Russian oil fields so watching closely as as things go on um, those two would be more on the overall supply demand side and then as far as more of a um, localized issue I think the shale oil production and the growth on it is an absolutely massive factor uh, I would say a vast majority of the people I talk to who don't know oil but they know sort of the the, the politics around oil constantly are saying well we got a hundred years of shale oil reserves we got 500 years of shale oil reserves and they're not really looking at the data at all they've just picked up this 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 point this talking point from 2015 or 2017 or 2018 and just ran with it um, because obviously as as Americans there's a sense of patriotism that comes with it uh, which can sometimes skew and bias uh, some of the data points out there so let me think the the shale growth and how much they can really grow uh, shale being 80 to 90 percent of the world's oil supply growth since 2014 if we lose that as a world uh, I think where where does where does the supply come from becomes the question. So um, it's a it's a very dynamic environment. I think it's a very polarized issue. There are people on both sides of the equation. There's there's very little agreement sometimes. Uh, but but I think those those three factors are are some of the major ones I would say. And then there's there's some minor factors uh, on the side which are to do with the uh, some of the politics and the ESG narrative around oil whether they they being the governments are are willing to go in and fix the problem um, or or they're just going to continue with this lack of investment in in supply which is going to create uh, some some major undersupply issues um, maybe not today but as the cycle continues uh, because I mean the the long lead oil supply needs investment now to bring oil online in two three five years and the more that gets delayed the more the um, the undersupply persists. Great. Well, I want to touch on a couple things you mentioned there, and the first being the ESG mandate. So I want to know your views on the so-called new green economy, the energy transition, the proliferation of these ESG mandates that cause a reduction in investment in the oil and gas sector. And would you say these factors are bullish or bearish in the long term? I think you, you mentioned you think they're bullish, but maybe you could explain why. Sure, yeah. So I think... Um... It can be looked both ways. The The ESG narrative is, is definitely out there and it's definitely impacting investment. Now, that on, on a surface level is definitely bullish for the average oil and gas investor because the less supply that comes online and as long as demand continues to increase, which it has for the last 100 years, really it's the one of the most stable curves uh, you can look at. Um, the... The restriction in investment is not just a a money stopped. It's a mindset that also proliferates throughout the entire financial system. So if I here want to drill an oil and gas well, but I know there's more ESG pressure coming down the road, maybe I decide not to not to start my oil and gas company. So there's a multi-layered impact that that ESG is definitely having. Um, I think it's it's definitely bearish for the consumer. Because the consumer wants cheap energy, the world economies and the world GDPs want cheap energy, um, and and the ESG narrative is is sort of fighting that at the same time. Um, that being said, I think I think there's a misconception as well that ESG is one of the only issues that are causing the lack of oil and gas investment, and, and I think it's it's not really the case. It's one of many issues that are piling on top of each other and creating this this massive lack of investment. Um, throughout throughout sort of this this period where you would think well hey oil prices were 80 90 hundred dollars and people are still not investing so we can't just blame it all on ESG but ESG has created this this effect where people are very slow to allocate capital even in a higher price environment they want higher prices they want more stability um, and I think that's that's going to continue as as much as we see certain funds like like Vanguard for example pulled out of the net zero pledge uh, five six days ago, there, it's it's slowly turning on the margins, but on the overall, the the push has been so extreme and backed with so much capital that it it sort of has to naturally play out uh, to be to be less impactful down the road. You can't just put all this money, trillions of dollars, into it and then suddenly say, "Oh, we're not going to do this anymore." Right? It 
it it beats the mandates of of a lot of what was going on so um, definitely a factor that i'm watching closely because as soon as that esg train stops impacting supply um you know you you sort of have this ticking clock at that point a a three to five year clock where projects will get sanctioned um to to potentially bring on in in the uh the three to five year period so I want to I want to touch on Vanguard there because they're the first major asset manager to withdraw from the net zero climate effort because well I think it's based mostly on political ideology instead of physics and I think you know funds like that they have a mandate to to make money and I think they realize that do you think Vanguard is the first domino to fall and will we start to see more funds dropping these ESG mandates and perhaps beginning to allocate capital to the oil and gas space Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic question. I think uh, very, very relevant, especially with the decision that's been made here uh, last week. And I think, you know, I I haven't really ever worked in Wall Street, so I'm not going to pretend that I know the way these people think. But what I've noticed in the oil and gas space is everybody is scared to be wrong. They, They don't really care about making money or about having being the first to report something. The big question is we cannot afford to be wrong because our team is so small anyway, it's been absolutely battered uh, throughout the years that, that we just play this conservative angle. And as soon as somebody else does something, we now go and copy them uh, as sort of like a machine that, that's a group thing mentality. So um, we're going to see what happens. I think BlackRock has also indicated that they are getting a bit tired of these sorts of policies, uh, Vanguard being a, a very major uh, fund owner there as well. So um, I think it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight, but this is a, a major, major step change, especially for it to happen in the U.S. Uh, I think I think is going to drive a lot of the policies going forward. I, I, I still don't expect anything to happen right away. It's going to be one by one. They all follow each other uh, and figure out where things go. And, and some of them have conflicts of interest. They have their own hundreds of millions of dollars tied up in, in ESG focused uh, funding, you know, no matter what it is. Uh, because they have to go and and like the way Vanguard I think is doing it, they are taking the fund, removing the products, and it might be put into some of their other products as well. So uh, it's all going to depend as time goes on. Uh, but but it is a a very interesting turn of events, um, especially given the some of the other events going on in the world, uh, where where it just seems like things are getting more and more polarized. And to see a major fund like Vanguard make a decision to go on the, um, it's not the anti-ESG camp, but to not push it as hard, uh, I think is, is, is really a testament to maybe um, some of the portfolio returns becoming more important versus having that right political narrative out there. Um, and it's a great sign. It's a great sign because at the end of the day, money talks and uh the ESG funds are not making that much money uh, over the last, call it 18 months uh, anyway. Yeah, that that was a perfect uh, summary of the situation. So I wanted to go uh, into the, the shale oil issue that you were mentioning earlier and touch on a recent tweet you made where you said consensus is building around declining shale productivity with Rystad Energy showing sustained declines over the past 18 months. 18 months. Along with heavy legacy shale declines, this double whammy is set to materially impact shale production in 2023. Pay attention when trends reverse. Could you expand on this and also provide a background on on shale oil production and its importance to the industry up until now? Sure, right on. Yeah, so I got to bear with me here. This might be a long answer, but uh, we, I think there's, there's many, many things that are, that are baked in there. Um, and, and it's kind of an interesting segue because we just talked about the group thing mentality. So a lot of what I was noticing is, is maybe earlier this year and, and even in late 2021, um, even as far as late 2019, it was, it was getting obvious with the data, um, that the shale well productivities, uh, were maxing out. And the interesting thing was, although people were talking about it on the margin, very, very few people, you never saw these sorts of reports come out of Reuters, out of Bloomberg, out of the CNBCs, out of the, the Reistads and the Inverses. They were continually gi- giving out these forecasts that showed shale growth was going to be another million barrels per day next year and 2024 and 2025, effectively echoing what the g- general consensus view was on the industry. So 
to see RISAT putting out, not just shoving this into some report, but actually highlighting uh, these, sorts, these sorts of things is, is once again a big step change as to the, where the world is viewing uh, oil supply demand and the lens uh, that it's viewing it from. So um, as a caveat to that, why I think this is really important is because there is a discount, I think, baked into the price of oil because a lot of the world, a lot of the financial traders believe that if the price of oil goes too high, oh, what's the problem? Shale will just ramp up more, add more rigs, and all of a sudden they can create their supply. So that itself is almost like an insurance policy that's dropping WTI, call it 10 15 $20. And, and when that mindset changes, when people realize, well, hang on a sec, shale is not responding at all, even at 90, 100, 100 plus oil. And they don't, you know, when you look at the underlying, they don't really have the acreage to go and increase another million, two, three barrels per day. Um, I think that itself is going to add this panic where the price of oil now re-rates maybe 10, 15, 20 dollars up. So one of the things I'm watching for, and really it's going to take the big boys of the world, the rice dads, the inverses, the ones that the banks use, the ones that the institutions use, to start putting out data like this to really change uh, people's ideology around this. And, and again, it's not gonna happen overnight. If you woke up and you believed that shale had 40, 50, 100, 200 years of reserve, you're not suddenly going to start believing that it's running out tomorrow. So there's a there's a time period to it. There's a data period to it um, that has to happen. Um, and and one of the things that that I've been talking about with shale well productivity is it's a double whammy effect where your legacy shale is still declining at 40, 50, 60 percent in some cases. Um, some of the late stage well declines are accelerating, so they're adding to the overall decline of the basin. And then you have declining well productivity on top of that, which not just has to make up for the legacy declines, it now has to make up for the growth as well. So um, I think it's it's becoming a point where both factors are going to hit at the same time. And there's a possibility that, um, you know, may, maybe not this year, but, but when shale oil, specifically the Permian, begins its decline phase, that decline phase could happen a lot faster than we saw in the Bakken and the Eagleford, which were more normally capitalized versus the Permian, which just got way overcapitalized. They they pushed this production curve up so high that they're unable to maintain it for the length of time that they figured. So those are sort of two points on, on that tweet specifically. Uh, as far as shale, shale history goes, um, I think sh shale is really a technological marvel. Like we we cannot discount what people are doing here. They're they're pulling oil out of literally like zero permeability rock with absolutely insane amounts of pressure uh, and water and fracking that's going on here. So um, I think the big thing to know about shale, as I'd mentioned a bit earlier, is that it was eighty plus percent of the world's oil supply growth uh, since twenty fourteen. So it has effectively subsidized the world um, more, even more than it should have because they overproduced and the world enjoyed cheap energy for a long, long time. Things were really getting hot. Uh, the economies were running really strong. Uh, people were starting to buy massive SUVs and just consume as much petroleum as possible. Um, so I think that that changing has has an impact, not just on oil pricing, uh, which which is expected to go higher if shale can't take the call when it's needed, uh, but really it's it's gonna result in a whole societal change as we become or, or transition into this new normal of, of higher energy pricing climate for, for the decade ahead. So um, very, very polarizing issue. One that it's very hard to uh, really nail down what's happening once again, because you, when you look at just the macro level data, everything looks fantastic. Well, why can't they grow another million? But when you really start diving into the company by company sort of prospects and looking at where they've drilled, the well productivities, uh, things become clear that that there is a problem um, happening here. And um, there there really is no fix to geology. You, you can't just create more geology. Um, so yeah, going to be going to be quite quite an interesting um, little ride here because no nobody really knows how the curve goes. 
But if we can just accept the fact that it's not going to grow at the million barrels per day rate, that itself is a big catalyst um, to the price of oil going forward here. So I'd like to pivot to how White Tundra approaches investing in the energy sector. There's a lot of options out there. It can be a little bit overwhelming when it comes to somebody new to the space. But I'm wondering if if you focus on explorers, developers, producers, oil field services, pipeline companies. Is it a mix of those? Where, Where do you allocate the most of your capital? Yeah, so for the most part, I am pretty open to any subsector within oil and gas. Um, that being said, my focus has been ENPs, so exploration and production companies. Uh, given that that's where my history is, uh, when I was in the field, we were doing production engineering on a lot of wells. We were doing workovers. We were fixing up fields, trying to get production maxed out. So a lot of my my expertise, if you will, uh, where I feel I have an edge in the sector is is in the upstream ENPs um, and the the upstream ENPs are, are some of the easiest ones to value because the data is the most transparent. Like I can literally go before the Q3 reports came out um, this year, I was able to go on, on Petroninja and look at every company's wells till the end of September. So I had their Q3 number before the Q3 number was put out. So um, it's, it's a lot more transparent you can really go in and make really excellent uh, estimations as to not just the production, but the cash flow, the funds flow, how much capital they spent. So from that standpoint, it's a lot lot easier, I think, to, to run valuations on, um, to anchor a margin portfolio to. I feel a lot more comfortable in, in that space. Um, so within, within that subsector recently, I've been noticing a, a divergence where some of the junior and smaller oil and gas companies are are doing really well holding up in downturns and then and then have this more upside torque built into them so um you know if you're asking me for for my positioning over the last little bit i've really been focusing more on on some of the smaller producers uh where i think the shotgun approach is not going to work so if you're just buying every junior company out there you you will not do well compared to just buying any small mid cap out there which by the way, still trades at 15, 20, 25% free cash flow in some cases. So uh, the, the risk reward on them is, is already really good. Um, and, and then once you go down into, into, I don't really want to say down the risk curve because the, the companies, the, the junior companies aren't inherently more risky. They're just smaller and, and they may suffer from some illiquidity. They might suffer from not the same reporting uh, going on. Uh, but really where, where I see opportunity at this point in the cycle, uh, I think what the Biden administration has done has been very successful. As much as I hate to say this, they have really dropped the price of oil. They have dropped the price of gasoline, uh, diesel, et cetera, throughout this year. But at what cost? And and the cost that they've paid is the longevity of the cycle has gotten much, much, much longer uh, by by firing off these these insurance bullets. And at the same time, uh, causing supply not to come online when when it could have really ramped up. Um, you know, you could have really ramped up your investments in, in deep water offshore, in some of the shale plays, doing some exploratory drilling, maybe some oil sands in 2022. And what have they done? They've gone the complete opposite way where they've created so much volatility in the price of WTI that like it's not even the ENPs, the, the actual... F- uh, paper traders who can make so much money off the volatility themselves are tapping out and they're saying, we can't deal with these. Like these, the, our models are completely broken. Our value at risk doesn't make any sense. So so I think the, the impacts of this are going to be felt over a longer period of time, uh, but it's done a really exceptional job at, at allowing an investor to go in, buy companies that are trading in this apathetic environment because you can see what's coming down the road much more clear. Um, you, you can't solve an energy crisis without more supply. And people have not been investing in supply over the last six months. So uh, at a time when demand continues to rocket up. So I think it's a, it's a really good setup from that way. Um, I'm, I'm always looking at new opportunities. I'm always looking at service companies. I'm looking at the offshore drillers. I'm looking at some of the tankers. I'm looking at ENPs all across the world. I get sent all all kinds of files, whether it's public, whether it's private, whether it's new placements, and really becomes a a relative trade 
um, because you're not you're not indexing yourself against the XLE. You're not indexing yourself against the broad market. It's about indexing yourself against the opportunities available in the market, um, which is which is really something um, that that I've been I've been waiting for for a long long time because. When these cycles come, if you invest properly and you compound those returns properly, it is not out of the question for your portfolio to be up 500x, 1000x over a three to five year cycle. So I think we, we're still very, very uh, early yet. I think um, it's not often where, where you sit here and you say, you know, we're, we're quite confident that the mid cap companies are going to go up 100% in the next two years. It's It's... That that is not how a normal market should function, but that's where we are um, today, and 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 it's just fascinating because uh, there's there's an investment for every investor in oil and gas. If somebody says none of these companies fit my mandate, and they're looking for oil and gas investments, I think they're not doing the right research because there is literally companies that have net cash on the books. There's companies with huge dividends. There's companies that are aggressively drilling. Uh, there's companies that are uh, these acquire co companies. Um, that are that are going out and becoming bigger empire building. Uh, there's there's junior companies that have 20 barrels a day. They have, there's junior companies with 500 barrels per day. It's it's really a an an open market out there. Um, and really, that's that's fascinating. As somebody who does these deep dives, I just love diving into the nitty gritty and um, trying to generate alpha where where possible. Yeah, and speaking of deep dives, you do a lot of those on your YouTube channel, which is an amazing resource for people interested in the oil and gas space. And you have a whole spreadsheet where you do calculations, you walk people through how to evaluate these different companies. And a big part of your spreadsheet and, and, and the data you look at is hedging. So could you talk to us about, first of all, what is hedging and why is it so important to look at that data when evaluating an oil and gas company? Yeah, certainly. I think um, one one of the major factors that I'm looking at into 2023 and onwards is is um, the hedging and the tax pools, both both unrelated but sort of related in the way you can value these companies and the big um, catalysts, if you will, that are in there. So one one of the interesting things is if you go look at the hedging, the way companies were hedging, there was a lot of barrels hedged from 2015 onwards until 2020 there was not the same number of barrels hedged in the higher oil pricing regime in 2011 to 2014. So companies were really hedging a lot of barrels for downside protection. When they were going in with their capital programs, they, they really wanted to know that, look, we were not that worried about the upside, but we cannot let these investments possibly become negative internal rates of return if the commodity price fell fell deep enough. So there was a lot of hedging going on. Um, some companies made a lot of money off it. Some companies didn't make that much money off it. The The issue being that when 2020 and 2021 hit, a lot of companies came into that with the same mindset. They they didn't really accurately figure out where the cycle was going. And, and maybe that's not their job anyway. Their job is just to maintain their minimum level of, of capital and protect that. So they, they ended up hedging into this really poor environment. And on top of that, the banks and the debt holders really push them like, look, you need to hedge a significant amount of your production into this heavily backwarded curve when the spot price is already very low uh, compared to either the cost of supply or where things were going. So uh, there, there's a bunch of companies that came into 2022 with absolutely atrocious hedging and some that even have 2023 hedging that's that's not very good. Um, and, and it's really set these companies back because while other companies have paid back debt, They've gone in and implemented a dividend and and bought back the shares cheaply. These companies were just paying off all their gains to the banks as a hedging loss. So it's really pushed them back, but that that's what creates an opportunity. As those hedges roll off, some of these companies, their their funds flow is going up 20, 30, 40, 60 percent in some cases, just because the year rolled into 2023. So um, some of them are trading cheaply that that don't reflect that hedge is rolling off yet and and really provide a lot of opportunity um, from from that standpoint. And I think I really want to tie this back to tax pool because tax pools are the other thing that companies had collected throughout 2015 to 2020. They were making uh, capital losses. They were making operating losses. There was exploratory work being done that they couldn't claim it against any profits. 
Um, and now, now we have companies that are, some are paying taxes, which is 23% um, in Canada. Some are still not paying taxes for not just this year, but another 24 to 36 months. So um, to, to bring it back to your previous question about how I allocate capital, if you look at my sort of my top five holdings in the portfolio, all of them have at least a two-year tax pool uh, horizon where they will not be paying tax. Uh, gives them a very, very strong competitive edge against their peers for the next couple of years um, because while other peers are paying taxes, these companies can go in and buy back shares, they can pay dividends, they can do acquisitions while the market is depressed. Um, and and really, if you can find companies where the hedges are rolling off and the company's trading cheaper already and they have the significant tax pool um, uh, runway, I think there's there's a strong case to be made that, that those are the sorts of companies that are really going to outperform um, because to be honest with you, people are not putting in the work. There's very few people that are running proper modeling around hedges dropping off, the royalty rates changing, the tax rates changing. Um, there's a lot of nuance to it. You can't just take 2022 cash flow and go and project it uh, as a 2023 cash flow. And um, I think those those that put in the work will will find uh, diamonds in there where you go, how how can this company trade at a fifth or a seventh the valuation as this XYZ peer, which is doing the exact same thing and is just known more. Um, so, so from a from a value investing standpoint, as you as you'd mentioned, uh, your passion was in similar to mine. I think it's uh, it's really bizarre to see, but um, that's where money's made. So I'm I'm more than happy that these dislocations exist in the market. Um, yeah, e- even still, so far into the cycle there's still massive dislocations um, as the cycle is becoming more and more clear. Um, and, and, you know, just, just to be clear, when I say the cycle, I don't mean what's happening in the last month because there's a lot of people out there wanting to throw shots and, and take victory laps that the energy crisis is over. I can, I can guarantee you the energy crisis is not over. Um, this is going to be a, a long problem, which will take a lot of innovation and a lot of capital to solve. Um, over the next next few years, maybe over the next um, decade plus here going forward. Completely agree with you there. Um, I know you focus mostly on Canadian oil and gas companies, but I'm wondering if you see any political risk there because you have both the Liberals and the NDP verbally attacking the oil industry, actively trying to move away from oil and gas, talking about windfall taxes, and the Canadian government seems to be all in on this idea of the new green economy. Should your average retail investor be worried about these things or, or is this all just noise to you? Yeah, so definitely something we follow very, very closely. I think I was I was relatively caught off guard with some of the windfall taxes and, and how easily they've been put, uh, pushed through in Europe and Colombia specifically, uh, which are already very high tax uh, regimes, high royalty rate regimes compared to North America. So um I think it's a it's a evolving sort of understanding as to what's happening. Um, there is a still a um, gray area whether these European companies are actually going to pay these taxes or they're going to fight them in court, like what's happening in Italy. Uh, Italy being one of the first con- uh, countries to pass a windfall tax uh, much much earlier this year. As far as North America goes, I think the the. Trudeau liberals have been clear that they're not going to do any sort of windfall tax yet. Uh, there was a semi-professional motion that was uh, denied uh, earlier this year when the NDP was really trying to push these these taxes on oil and gas producers. Uh, the liberals came in and shut it down. They did create the buyback tax, but it is a very lax sort of tax. It doesn't kick in until 2024, and it's a very small percentage anyway as to the, the impact that these buybacks can have. So... Not not really all that concerned yet. Um, one that every oil and gas investor should watch, not just in North America, but in other parts of the world, because it sets a precedence that North American governments can then say, well, look, you know, it's going on in Europe. It's going in Colombia. It's going in Brazil. It's going on in Australia, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So then they go and, and bring it on into our, our domestic lands. So um, there's definitely political risk. But I think it's been overblown a bit. I get a lot of questions about windfall tax and other sorts of dividend taxation. 
um, and whether the government's going to go nationalize the oil industry. You know, things like this are 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 very long processes in North America. It's what makes it's really what makes the North American, you know, specifically the American justice system so strong is that everything has a process to it. You can't just come out and say, we're going to do X, Y, Z, uh, perhaps like some of the other parts of the world, which are more um, democracies, but there's still things that can be passed through under the guise of energy security or or national security um, with, with no with no repercussions per se. So I do expect a lot of fight in 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 North America itself. Um, so not something that I'm currently concerned about, not something that gets put in the model right now. But as things change, if something does come up, we then put put an expected value on that and and, and incorporate it within the model, uh, just like what's been done with the European taxes and then the uh, the Colombian tax as well, which is pretty restrictive um, to to some of these companies that were. Tr- that were really modeling really exceptionally, and this has just come and stabbed them in the back, um, along with the investments that these companies are going to make in those uh, in those countries. So, um, I guess the the short answer would be watching, but but not concerned until something serious is is being tabled, um, and and really hits the uh, congressional sort of debates, uh, and and there onwards. Right, so something to be aware of and keep an eye on, but not necessarily something that's a present danger here and now. That that makes a lot of sense. So stepping outside of Canada, are there other jurisdictions you're looking at? You mentioned you get sent messages and emails all the time about different oil and gas deals in different parts of the world. Are there any other jurisdictions that you see particular strength in when it comes to the oil and gas industry? So outside of North America, I would say I, I don't really focus on it too much. I, I evaluate every single deal for the most part, just because I'm curious about oil and gas. I want to learn as much as possible. And and sometimes I get sent really, really good due diligence packages done by uh, either large shareholders or other investors, groups of investors uh, that are sending me stuff. So um, the, there is a lot of interesting prospects out there. I'm not going to say that North America is the only place to be. But I feel my edge in terms of knowing management, knowing field personnel, knowing the acreage, knowing the basins is in North America. So something that, well, Canada specifically, if there is something that comes in outside of that, it now not only has to look very attractive on a relative basis, it it has to absolutely destroy that on a relative basis because the risk is just way too high uh, in terms of missing things in the oil and gas space, I think. Every single prospect looks good. Every single thing is marketed as a working petroleum system. Um, everything is out there saying we hit this oil, we saw this, we saw that. So it's very easy for an investor to get confused uh, as to, well, how come everything looks good and then you didn't hit oil or it became uncommercial? Um, so for that for that reason specifically, I, I haven't found anything yet uh, that's outside North America that is that is really, really attractive to me. Um, on a on a relative basis, most of my investments are are in Canada. I am moving, as I mentioned, a bit further down uh, into the smaller cap companies where I see more torque for for relatively uh, the same the same unit of risk, if you will. Um, that being said, I think I'm 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 more and more recently been looking at massive discoveries. So there is this arms race to go and look at huge discoveries where you go and delineate some some massive pool out there, which is a, let's let's just call it for argument's sake, like a 5 billion plus barrel reserve would be the definition that we're looking for because we, we really have not found these sorts of uh, discoveries in a long, long time. At least not where they can be, uh, you can go in there and actively develop these systems. So I think as part of that, I don't really want to mention any names, but, but I think within North America itself, there are, there are a, a few interesting uh, prospects out there. There are certain states and provinces that are sitting on literally oceans of oil and have these sorts of massive discoveries in the past uh, where, where something has stalled them out. And, and I see like great potential in, in the risk reward on some of these names. Um, haven't really actively deployed any capital except a very small position in, in one of them. Um, but, but yeah, for the most part, I think North America is the place to be. It is the safest jurisdiction. Um, we, we, we take the political stability for, for granted a lot of times. 
Um, it's one of the ones with the lowest royalty regimes out there. Um, it's one of the ones with the most stable production, closest to home. You know the management teams a lot better. Um, they're they're well-respected individuals within the community, so they're not going to go outside of that and try to do you know interesting, uh, strange things as I've been seeing with maybe some of the more multi or or international producers um, who who don't have the same um, same sort of reputation to uphold, uh, if you will, um, and and I also think uh, some of these companies. Uh, I have grown to find within my oil and gas investing career, some of these companies are run as lifestyle companies. So they're used to go and, and, and really enjoy life as a, as a management and board. Um, and, and these companies are not going to do well because the, the new oil and gas investor is a very um, technically focused, more, in, more informationally advantaged uh, oil and gas investor. This is no longer, I'm just going to throw my money in here and it's going to take five years and I'm just being fed stuff by the management team. Um, that, that is not going to happen uh, anymore. The, the appetite for that is just not there after getting absolutely railed for the last eight years, call it. Uh, people are very frustrated and fed up. And the people entering the industry as investors will enter as um, not, not quite activist investors, but ones who are watching every move. They're tracking the well results. They're looking at any acquisitions you make with a very, very a strong magnifying lens and saying, like, did you have to do this? I understand this might be a good deal, but did you have to do this? Uh, you know, it's it, it's going to become a very interesting, I think, oil and gas investing climate because the bad actors um, are are just not going to be allowed to succeed, uh, I think, um, in in this cycle and, and I think ever again, because um, I think one of the points that I should have mentioned when you asked about shale was, was that I think the the level of access to individual well by well data and fracks and drills and the aggregate uh, production and all sorts of metrics is just like um, orders of magnitude better than it was in the 2011 to maybe call it 2016, 2018 phase uh, where you were you were the blind leading the blind. People would just make up certain narratives uh, that were not backed up by data and, and go out and, and start talking about it. Well, now I can literally refute that with a 15 second, um, you know, data visualization number that I can pull up. So, um, yeah, I guess that's that's my long way of saying that that I think North America is the one to stick with because you have a huge data edge, huge informational edge and, and, and stability edge um, that the rest of the world, I think we we maybe are, are, are misunderstanding the the lowness of risk in North America and we're not understanding enough the risk that exists in other jurisdictions, especially when oil prices rise, because there is a lot of, uh, uh, let's just call it, there's, there's a lot of money to be made by disrupting operations and going in and, and, and tapping pipelines and, and everything else that goes on in the rest of the world. I was wondering if you might be able to share some names with us uh, because you do a lot of these, as I said, incredible evaluations on, on YouTube. Guys, like seriously, if, if you have any interest in the oil and gas space, uh, Shabam is the guy you need to go to. Um, has there been any any companies you've looked at recently that have caught your eye or, or that you think investors maybe should take a closer look at? Yeah, you bet. So I think um, I'm going to refer to to some of the top companies in my in my portfolio for full disclosure, I mean, these have been picked for a reason. Um, and the reason has been, there's there's a few things that the market is is not giving attention to quite yet. And those are the companies that I really, really love getting into. So, so I guess I can talk about three here. Uh, the ones that I've discussed in the past as well. I think my top holding uh, Surge Energy, one I've, I've held for about 18 months now. Um, I think I've, I've mentioned this before, the, this cycle is going to be an engineers and geologist cycle, not just from picking companies, but also from, from if, if one is looking to go out and actively deploy capital, uh, oil has become so hard to find that you really need that, that technical edge, uh, some sort of idea that you stumbled upon uh, earlier to go in and really make, make these uh, companies work. So, so the reason I like Surge um, is, is the same reason I like Crew and the same reason I like Meg. They, the, the free cash flow plus the net asset value plus the tax pools and then upside on the drilling locations themselves. 
So in the case of Surge, they they made some really, really good acquisitions last year. Uh, the market did not like them at the time. Um, and then they come out this year and they've drilled three, four, five of the top wells in Saskatchewan ever drilled. And these are wells that pay out in four to five weeks at $80 oil. And they pay out four to five times in the in the course of one year. So it really generates this more cash flow than maybe some of the other companies that are out there uh, drilling tier two, tier three, tier four wells. So um, done done really well in the acquisitions. It's got exceptional torque to higher oil pricing. Uh, the net asset value is orders of multiples um, or, or the net asset value is multiples of, of today's current share price. They've got two to three years of tax pool and they've got all this undeveloped land acreage, which so far has just not been capitalized. People are not going to capitalize their lower tier properties within a corporation when oil is 40 bucks or 60 bucks. So now that oil prices are rising, some of these properties start to compete for capital because of the inbuilt torque they have built in. Uh, you can go and increase production in these properties, which reduces operating cost. You go and start generating exceptional net backs out of these properties. So uh, that's, that's one on surge. Crew is relatively in the same boat. They have massive land packages that are outside the Blueberry First Nations issues. Uh, they have optionality on more gassy mounting acreage, on more, more liquids rich mounting acreage, and then the ultra high condensate uh, mounting acreage, uh, some of which is non-core and can be sold for hundreds of millions of dollars as they just proved with their uh, land sale about, call it about two months ago now, uh, they sold a land package for, for $130 billion, which had literally no associated reserves with it. Sold it, paid off debt, um, they've got they've they've again got a two p even a one p net asset value that's that's higher much higher than the current share price um, and and again they've got tax pools for two three four years you'll see this becoming a common theme uh, in the companies that I that I refer to um, and then Meg Energy the oil sands darling it is the one one of the easiest companies to understand they've got one asset with exceptional geology one of the lowest steam oil ratios out there. They are beating their production estimates. They've got a 55-year, 60-year, two-peer reserve. So they just produce. There is no, very little CapEx. They don't, they don't need to go out and start new projects. They don't need to buy any companies. They don't need to explore. They just have the one property, which they jammed somewhere between $5 and $7 billion of infrastructure in right off the bat. And now they're paying, paying that back. The debt is almost done. 50% uh, of the free cash flow is going to buy back. So you have this natural support uh, to the price, uh, to the um, to the share price. And um, one, one with a hidden catalyst because they really have not been making that much money recently with WTI lower and then WCS differentials that are much higher than normal. So now take that number, put 50% of that to buybacks. It's not a material really number. Well, as the differential normalizes with, with some of the refineries coming online, uh, the SPR sour release is ending, OPEC cutting back on sour barrels, um, and then WTI itself rebounds, there's a, there's a once again, a double whammy impact where that buyback can really accelerate uh, as time goes on. So I think on the small to mid caps, th those are the names. Um, and as far as full disclosure, my, my entire portfolio is completely public. Uh, I update it once a month on the website. So, so there's... All the names are on there um, as to what I currently hold um, right now. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Shabam. There's so much knowledge shared here, and I'd definitely like to have you back on because there's a lot more to discuss too. I'd really like to dive into OPEC+, Plus, the draining of the, the SPR, um, and the Russian situation, the embargo on Russian oil, the price cap. There's so much happening right now in, in the oil world, so we'll definitely have to have you back on. Um, I'll put a link to your YouTube channel below for those who are interested. Is there anywhere else you'd like to direct people online if they want to hear more from you? Um, I think my YouTube is my main one. I do, I do keep a pretty active Twitter feed as well, um, and, and, and I try to have these spurts where I'm on Twitter spaces a lot. So I think the last couple of weeks I was just off, off a bit uh, vacationing and and spending time with friends and family, but I'm back on now. So I just love the conversation that's been going on in, in some of these spaces and the back and forth you can have. So uh, I think that's the best, best place to find me. Um, if not, my email is always open. So I get uh, lots of very, very interesting messages about very specific uh, subsects of a subsector uh, that people like to, um, you know, bring up and, and discuss. So uh, always open to that. And, um, you know, I think it's, uh, we're, 
we're not that many out there, the, the oil and gas investors. So I think using using every source of data possible and, and having that back and forth is just really important, um, including getting the word out there, because this is this is not just an investment. This is, um, you know, there's there's two ways to think about it. One is if you don't invest in energy companies, there's no way to hedge yourself against the rising cost of energy which goes into absolutely every single thing you consume. It's not it's not just gasoline. The price of diesel and gasoline and jet fuel makes its way through every single thing um, in the economy. So I think that's that's one of the messages that I've been trying to share recently. Um, and the second thing being this this is really an, an energy security and an energy poverty conversation. This uh, the Western world has grown to its massive power because of oil and gas and fossil fuels and 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 energy um and and the uh the rest of the world which is the majority of the, of the population of the world wants the exact same things and they're willing to pay for it so um really if if you know if the western world doesn't want to become a second tier energy uh consumer we really need to invest in our, in our own supply have really strong um stability as to where the oil and gas supplies are going and and that's not just oil and gas it's 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 renewables it's wind it's solar it's nuclear we need a lot of energy because people are consuming a lot of energy and uh, there's no change to that trend as far as um, you know the data goes so yeah appreciate you having me on and and always happy to talk oil uh, gas opec uh, drilling rigs etc awesome well i'll put a link to your twitter and to white tundra investments website as well in the description Great having you on and looking forward to continuing the conversation in the future. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.